We have three great speakers. We should have a great uh, discussion. Let me just say a couple things about the economy and then turn it over to Carl. We'll turn it over to Dave. We'll turn it over to Nick. Uh, and one thing about this economy, it seems a little confusing. Um, it's confusing in the sense that I would say over the last uh, three or four years, uh, the unemployment situation has been about as bad as it's been in my lifetime. Uh, here we've had uh, the unemployment rate at or above 9% uh, for about three years. There seems to be very little momentum uh, for that unemployment rate uh, to go down. And as you know, many people think that in addition to the 9% who are officially unemployed, uh, there are a number of workers, a large number of workers who are discouraged and therefore no longer looking for a job. There are people that want full-time work but have part-time work. There are people who have full-time work but they, they feel that it's not a satisfactory job. They feel like they're underemployed. Some measures of the total uh, underemployment and unemployment are 16 percent of the working age population. Even perhaps worse than that is I think there are more long-term unemployed now. People who have been unemployed for more than a year uh, or any other you know, year and a half, whatever uh, milestone you'd like to name, there are millions of people that haven't had a job in a long time. So from a jobs perspective, these are rough times. Now what's a little confusing is corporate profits are not too bad. Corpor corporations are doing pretty well. Even the stock market, as volatile as it's been, is roughly double where it was at the bottom. And so uh, these aren't great times, but from a corporate pr profit, corporate, and even as a stockholder, these aren't nearly as rough a times as it seems uh, from uh, a job seeker's uh, point of view. Um, so that's kind of the, I'm trying to, Hopefully, in this discussion, we can figure out what is going on. Why are the jobs so far out of whack with the uh, rest of the economy? And then, I'm sure related to that, there are a lot of companies that are adding jobs. Just not in California. Just not in the United States. Uh, and uh, so part of the, uh, uh, you know, the title of this uh, evening was kind of optimistic, keeping America competitive. But uh, we could have had making America competitive, I suppose, as well. Uh, how do we get the job engines uh, going again? So I don't know. I'm just using those as kind of uh, teasers. But I thought we would start off with Carl, and then we'll just uh, uh, go through this great lineup. Murderers Row, as they used to say for the Yankees. Uh, so Carl, if you go first, you can sit there or come here, whichever you prefer. Well, I'll just sit, and with the hope of making this as interactive as possible. Sure. First thing is. I challenge Dave to arm wrestle. Three, <laughs> three pointers from the top of the key. Okay, there you go. <laughs> arm wrestling sounds like a losing proposition here, <laughs> so I'll, I'll go for the three pointers. Um, let me just say a few things about the economy and just give a point of view on it. I, you know, I think in some ways you almost understated it. I think you understated the extremes. I think unemployment is a huge problem and may not get better, and it's not clear how it will get better. And corporate profits are doing really well. Companies are thriving in California. Companies are hiring in California. They, but I think we're running into a couple things that are going on. And so the first, the first one is, I do think we have a structural problem going on in the aging of the population. Um, we have, for the first time, a, a reasonable assumption on the people, on the part of people that their children may not grow up to be better off than they are. And this, you know, and I think it all comes back to this idea, you know, that for, you know, the last hundred years there have been a billion people sharing in the wealth of the world. We're now moving not quite to the other six billion sharing, but there are another billion or two billion people who are participating in a global economy and sharing in the wealth of that. I think some of the structural things we, we see going on is that some of the assumptions that we had growing up, that for example, with a high school education, I could get a middle class job working in a factory is disappearing. You know, it's, I think for a while people worried that those jobs were moving offshore. I would say in some places those jobs are disappearing. 
You know, we, there's as much to lose to automation as there is to offshoring. And I think the nature of work is changing and the way we remain competitive. You know, I don't, I don't think it's as easy as to say, you know, we're going to fight against the machine. The, the question is, is how do we fight with the machines? How do we take advantage of the information technology and the new manufacturing technology so that we can be more competitive? Uh, you know, one of the interesting things about jobs is, you know, I think there are a number of policy things, and I won't, I won't try to abuse my time here. I'm going to pass the baton soon. Winston. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, one, you know, one of the things we look at is, you know, as a company, we, we have about, oh, 7,000 plus employees worldwide. We try to hire in the U.S. One of the questions that comes up for us all the time is about finding the right skilled people. And, you know, one of the issues that certainly most of the technology companies face is this question about immigration and the question of H-1B visas. And I, you know, I continue to believe we have, you know, an absolutely idiotic national policy about keeping the best and brightest, allowing them to come here to be educated, but then giving them kind of a kick in the pants. You know, and people have talked about this before. You know, I, I can't agree more about stapling, you know, green cards to every technical degree. You know, if you look at this engine of growth in Silicon Valley and you say, you know, a substantial fraction of the technology companies that were created here were either um, first generation immigrants or second generation immigrants. The idea of taking people, using our best institutions to train and educate them, and then saying, thank you very much, go back. Just, just you know, I, I can't even begin to understand where somebody thinks that happens. But I think it, you know, leads to some of the issues that we see going on, which is, you know, in certainly my trips to Washington, it, the idea of immigration reform, particularly when it relates to high tech workers, has bipartisan support. So despite having bipartisan support, it's something that can't make its way through the sausage making machine. And I look, you know, and so as I look now at business, one of the biggest things I see is this lack of confidence in governments, you know, and it's particularly focused on Washington, D.C. and Brussels. And here's an example where people say, this is a great idea, but this is an idea we've been talking, you know, I personally have been there lobbying for 10 years about it, and I have no great expectations that it'll get better in the next 10 years than it got in the last 10 years. So I think there are lots of solutions out there. I think what is holding people back and is really a crisis of confidence right now, and a lot of the confidence seems really focused around government agencies and their ability to set policy that makes sense and is in the natu national interest. I really resonated, <clears throat> is my mic on? I really resonated with something Carl said at the beginning, just structurally we have some challenges in America. I'll tell you a quick story, I mean many people here probably have a similar story, but I grew up in the coal regions of Pennsylvania, you know, near Reading and Allentown, Pennsylvania. My parents didn't go to college, they didn't even graduate high school. But what did they try to do is instill in me to try to be better than they were. And they tried to push me to study computer science and engineering, and that's what I went and did. They encouraged me to move to Silicon Valley and you know, almost immigrate to California. <laughs> 25 years ago, almost to the day, I did that graduated college, drove my car across the country, and came here. And it's amazing to watch what opportunities we had during the 25 years that are here. But so many things have changed in the last 25 years, and some things for the real bad, structurally. And we don't just have the aging problem, but we have the motivation problem that's happening in America today that's just really unbelievable. I had a chance to go to China just recently with one of the partners of mine, and we were recruiting about a thousand uh, new employees in Shenzhen. Some of you probably know where it's at. We had almost 10,000 applicants. Some of the people waited all night long to kind of get interviewed for the job. I don't know how many of you interviewed college grads in America recently, but <laughs> let's just say they didn't wait all night long to kind of go for a job. So it's amazing to watch that in that time. You know, 25 years ago. I couldn't believe my luck to drive out to Silicon Valley and find a company like Oracle who was just getting started. I mean, how lucky can you get? And to join the companies that I had a chance to do. And as Carl said, you know, here we are, we have these structural and policy issues related to that dream that we once had here in California in some ways, because what are we doing? Educating people, sending them back home, and building Silicon Valleys elsewhere. 
around the world. And a quick story for you, at McAfee just four years ago, we had about 1,000 employees in California. A uh, company had just short of 4,000 employees uh, some time back. I'll tell you now, we have about 800 employees in California, and we've doubled and tripled the employee count of the company over that period of time. What does that tell you? You know, we found ways to get human capital elsewhere, and the Silicon Valleys that grew elsewhere around the world is what we leveraged because we couldn't get H-1B visas. In one day, they were sold out. So how does a company like McAfee, a mid-cap company, compete with a Microsoft or others to get the H-1B visas? They were gone long before I had a chance to get there. And we found ourselves finding talent elsewhere in the world. So structurally, we have these challenges, both with the immigration reform that has to happen, the education and motivational things. There's so many things we can do to solve it, and they seem so simple to me at times, but watching the bureaucracy, the policy issues, the, the challenges that we have, Quick another story for you. I applied nine times at the state of California just because I, I wanted to see how many times I could get rejected <laughs> for a research and development grant to keep engineers in California. Got rejected nine straight times over a multi-year period. The government interlock that we have, both state and federal levels, is just completely broken. And if I go to Vietnam or I go to China or I go to Eastern Europe, do you think that government interlock is broken? <laughs> no way. I just built a, a research facility for McAfee in Chile, in Santiago, Chile. It costs, you know, first of all, a fraction of the cost for engineers as it does here. And the government was willing to subsidize 25, 30% of the education, the cost to build the facility, hire the employees. And now I have a, a long-term, very loyal location in a pretty interesting place in the world that could have been right here. So example after example of us kind of losing that, that edge that we had over the years is amazing to watch. So a lot there, but I wanted to kind of tell that story because kind of a person who grew up with such an American dream of watching that and watching it go away, and now actually interviewing some of the kids from the parents that we've worked with and watching them not want a job is almost amazing. So considering how hard we all worked in some of our, anyways, I'll turn it over to Nick if you want. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I, I was actually going to talk. Uh, it works very well with uh, Carl and David's view, partly as my perspective as an immigrant and partly, I guess, as uh, some facts and figures, as you'd expect from an economist. You can hear that I'm British. I grew up in uh, London. I only left about five years ago, and I've been living in Stanford since then. And in fact, I came with my wife, who's a Scot from Glasgow, and my three kids. And uh, one of the things that's very interesting for me, being over in the US, is Americans seem both very tough on themselves and in some senses very pessimistic in that I was speaking to a journalist today and he was trying to get me to you know, take a very negative line on the economy. And one of the things you see just in looking at the longer span of things is America is doing incredibly well and Americans are extremely wealthy. So I wanted to actually show you some, uh, a couple of slides of data and then talk to you about my experiences. So this will, if I can get the slides up. So one of the things I'm just going to point out is you get this sense of incredible pessimism, but in fact, things don't look that bad if you look at where we are right now. So here are numbers which are GDP per capita uh, for 2010 uh, in purchasing power parity. So they're equivalent numbers. It's from the IMF. It's for the world's largest countries. And America's at the top. Um, you know, I notice this very personally when you come over here, the houses are bigger, the cars are bigger, uh, people go on more expensive holidays, the food is definitely better in, in America than uh, I was experienced in the UK. And uh, I, I saw it when we did our usual immigrants trip back to the U UK. We'd been here about a year and a half, and I took my wife and kids back. And my daughter had already become American because she said, um, you know, when you're in London, how come the cars are so small? And, uh, you know, you kind of realize that like, Americans are wealthier and that they benefit from that. And in a sense, growth isn't so fast right now, but in the longer scope of things, America's done very well. So why, one of the quick questions I wanted to ask is why has America been so successful? And, you know, linked in a, in a different way to people like Carl and David, I think a lot of it revolves around actually American firms on average are extremely well managed. Uh, in fact, on average, you know, globally, they're some of the best managed firms around the world. And I'll show you another slide of data. So for about the last decade, I've been working with a big group from McKinsey, but also from Harvard Business School, Cambridge in the UK, London School of Economics, to try and get a sense of measuring management practices around the world. Now, I won't go through this in a lot of detail, but the basic idea is to try and evaluate 
how much firms use targets, uh, tough targets, short and long run targets, how much they continually monitor what goes on and how strong they are on incentives. And what we found is American firms, interestingly both at home and abroad, as Carl and David were talking, this is part of the issue, are extremely well run. So if you visit an American firm, this is for medium-sized manufacturing firms, you visit an American firm, they're typically collecting a huge amount of data, processing it all the time, continually improving, they have tough targets. High performance get accelerated up through the firm, underperformance, you know, pretty fast get fixed or uh, kicked out. If you go to some of the developing countries at the bottom, and I should say Greece is down there. Greece wasn't, when we collected the data in 2006, I guess, was, uh, I guess still really isn't a developing country, but it's heading down. Um, <laughs> They're typically pretty bad, so I've been doing a lot of work with Ascension, the World Bank out in India recently, and if you visit Indian firms, you know, the, the, the firm is in chaos, there's inventory lying all over the place, there's very little data, they have not much idea what's going on. And in that sense, it's not surprising uh, America in terms of le growth levels is, it levels is doing well. So then, you know, why is, why, is, why is American management so good and why are Americans in general pretty wealthy? Well, I think there are three reasons. Um, one, and this will come up. So one is something, again, I've noticed very much. America is incredibly competitive. So America has large free markets. Well, as a result, badly run firms basically improve or get driven out of business. So here are some numbers looking at cross-sectional spreads. From five out of five will be on this grid. Firms that are amazingly well run in terms of monitoring, evaluating, uh, kicking out underperformers, promoting high performers. At the other end is you know, very badly run firms. I have in my mind a, a Soviet bloc public utility company or something like, you know, <laughs> Russian electricity. They are, uh, you just don't see these types of firms in the U.S. If you go to India, there are loads of these types of companies. They're incredibly badly run. There's a bunch of them, and we've worked, looked in Brazil and China, a kind of similar situation. And so, you know, one of America's big advantages, it just has very open competitive markets. It's had that for more than a century. I don't see that going away. Um, a second uh, benefit is, interestingly, America has a very strong legal system, which you might not think is a big advantage, but I, I'll tell you a bit of a story about what I see out in India, which is, if you go out to India, every firm you come across, the management team, the senior managers, the CEO, the CFO, the you know, chief operating officer, they're family members. So you, you really just don't come across firms with professional external managers. And the reason for that is, it's very hard to trust anyone. So if I had... Uh, I don't, John is, uh, I hired him as an external manager in my firm and I walked away. The big problem in India is if I caught him stealing or pilfering something, of course John would never do that, but you know, <laughs> if I caught the, uh, any malfians going on, the court system's so poor it's very hard to do anything about it. So of course the natural outcome is owners run their firms and that's common throughout the developing world. In the US, it's much easier to deal with, with someone that misbehaves, you take them to court, you know, you prosecute them, you get the money back. And as a result, in America, you see much more common ownership patterns like McAfee or, uh, for example, it, 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 in, in Autodesk, in terms of uh, different differential ownership, dispersed ownership, you see much more private equity. Walmart-type firms, family-owned, but have an external CEO. Uh, at the bottom, there's family-owned, family-run companies. The other group that makes me worried in terms of recent policy moves, of course, is government ownership. Government ownership is a, a disaster wherever we see it around the world. And again, I, you know, we're kind of nervous in going through the reform process that you'd see increased ownership of the economy. It doesn't seem to have gone that much further beyond the banking sector. But you know, I was worried in the sense of uh, government ownership is not a good thing. Finally, and this links very much to the visa story, the area where, in terms of keeping America competitive, I think there is an issue is around education. So you know, one question is, why do we need so many highly skilled immigrants coming in. And I, I'm one of those people that came in on a visa. Uh, so I clearly benefited from this. And it's in part because today America's really struggling to educate enough people to meet the, the skill demand. So the history of America is kind of amazing. If you go back 100 years, America was the first country that really pushed in terms of broad high school education. So America, if you go to 1930, America was massively better educated Americans than Europeans. And that propelled American growth throughout the 20th century. What's happened recently is two problems. One, funding's dried up. Uh, I mean, I see it with my kids in Cal I have three kids in Californian schools, and money's incredibly short. But the other thing that's been a problem is the school system in the U.S. is suffering in terms of just bad, bad management, bad organizations. So here is some management scores for other sectors. You know, healthcare on the left, 
American hospitals, they're not, they look pretty good by international standards. So the bottom right retail, American retailers are incredibly impressive by international standards. American schools are not fantastic. And a lot of the problem is in American schools, A, you have the tenure system. So if you've been a, a teacher for two, three years, you often get tenure, which I guess as an academic, having just talked about mm -hmm. tenure, I shouldn't you know, say much more, but it's hard if you have an underperforming teacher to deal with them if there's no way to, to uh, move them out of the school. And there's, there's a whole series of case studies and evidence on this. And the other thing that's more amazing for, a, I think, for a business you know, audience is the fact that in many states it's actually illegal to evaluate employ teachers based on performance data. So for example, in New York, you're not allowed to use things like value-added scores to set pay or promotion. So the idea is you can't explicitly into the regulation, you're not allowed to uh, look at the the uh, test grades of the teachers at the students at the beginning of the year versus the end of the year. And that, as you can imagine, makes problems extremely difficult. So, you know, to, to, to I guess, summarize um, on keeping America competitive, to date, it's done very well. I think the two of the three advantages that seem, you know, permanent competitive markets and a good legal system. The thing that makes me extremely worried, and I guess links very much into David and Carl's issue, is we're just not educating enough uh, people to go into the workforce. If you look at the unemployment problem, it's primarily an issue of unskilled. I was looking today, actually, if you look at people with a university degree or above, unemployment rates are 4%. They're very low. If you look at people that didn't complete high school, it's 15%. So you can really see where the issue is coming from. And partly it's funding, but partly it's a more basic issue about just managing the school system properly. So I think what we'll do is I, I'm just going to ask a, a, a few questions or try to stimulate a little bit of discussion. But, uh, you know, if I hear some stomach growling, we'll, we'll, we won't take too long. And then you can uh, come back with the uh, more interesting questions. But I was going to ask uh, Carl and Dave uh, about the education system, and, uh, or at least indirectly. Americans like to think that, you know, we may not have the greatest education, uh, but we're really innovative, that, we, they're, that they're, we're inventors, that uh, maybe other people can do the development, but the real bright ideas come from here. Uh, is that true, or are we just kind of patting ourselves on the back? Or Do you still find that uh, uh, your real, I don't know, your, your, your SEAL team, the, 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 the team that really is going to invent the next product, is, is that, are those uh, in America, or are those, uh, being ex those kind of operations exported abroad as well? Both of you. Okay, yeah, sure. I would say I think today it's still more American phenomena. And I don't think it's necessarily, I think education plays a role in it. I think there's a big cultural component in terms of risk taking and the cultural acceptance of failure, which I think is a huge deal. I think it's access to capital that also allows people to do it. Um, I, I think there is a cultural spirit of invention and innovation. And so I think it's true, but I don't, I think for years people thought we had the monopoly on it. And I think what we're beginning to see, I think there are incredible places around the world. I mean, I recently took a trip to Israel. It's the most entrepreneurial place. You know, it's an entire country that looks like Silicon Valley. And, you know, so despite what you read, you know, in the New York Times, what's going on on the streets there is everyone's in a startup. Everybody's creating a new technology business, and they're looking, you know, and they're looking to sell it. Uh, so it's phenomenal. I, you know, I do think there are places. I grew up in an era where people thought, for example, Japan was going to take over the software industry, and they would have floors of programmers, and yet, you know, there's not a single Japanese program piece of software that any of us use. And you know, software and most technology still is a U.S. phenomena. But I think we kid ourselves if we don't realize that China is being incredibly discipline, disciplined and purposeful about understanding our industries and educating its people and wanting to move that into a domestic industry. They have, you know, very, very concerted effort to move from being a low value provider of manufacturing and cheap labor to moving up the value chain. And I think there are other places in the world. And so while I think we have an advantage today, you can certainly see a lot of the pack gaining on us. 
Yeah, I would echo what Carl's saying, but maybe even more aggressively state that I think the pendulum's been swinging pretty quickly towards America lacking the innovation now. I mean, just a couple of years ago, watching the product managers, the product marketing teams who really design products, that was largely an American-led kind of activity, and that was primarily because the customer interaction was so much greater from maybe some of the management kinds of activities that Nick had alluded to. So they understood what to build because what the customers drove, but that's been changing so fast. And I think we've now, at least at McAfee, Polycom, I know both those companies largely, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 and 90% of the engineering is outside America today. Um, most of the product management, product marketing roles are outside America today. And global companies like Carl and, and what I've been able to be a part of, we, we, will, we will magnetize to where the talent is. If it's in America, we'll use it. If it's in Chile or Israel or China, we'll use it. And what we're finding is we're finding it outside of America and it's cost less, they're more motivated, it's easier to work in those countries and they're becoming more innovative. So that pendulum swinging pretty quickly, and it's, it's a little scary to watch happen from our perspective, at least if you were born and raised, like at least I was, to see how fast that pace is changing. And I think certainly for this industry, it's going to move even quicker as we're watching. I just saw a statistic. I now think greater than 50% of all the Series A, B rounds of venture capital are from farm-born um, you know, CEOs and founders at this point. So most companies' innovations are coming from um, personnel and employees who didn't grow up here, aren't American native. So we're finding a quick change to that, I think, and it's only accelerating from what I see. Yeah, one of the, I just yeah. say one thing, which is, I think it's interesting in the role of being executives, you often find this incredible tension between doing what's right for the company and what you would think of as being patriotic. Yeah. And, you know, in the end, in running companies, you end up being incredibly pragmatic. You know, your thing is to create value for your shareholders, build the best products, satisfy your customers. And so we can sit here, you know, over dinner and wring our hands about what's going on in Washington or Brussels or whatever. But at the end of the day, what you do when you go to work is you find a way to work through the problem. You know, it's about figuring out answers. So if we, we go and we lobby about H-1B visas, if that doesn't work, we find another way to go solve the problem, which is to hire people in other places. We can argue about whether repatriation of offshore profits is a good idea. But regardless, we found ways to use that offshore money to better serve our companies. And so there's this real interesting tension between what you would say is the best thing for America and what's best for your company. And you, you can feel it tearing at you all the time. So I was going to... Uh change the subject just slightly and ask Nick Bloom about, you know, I started off talking about how uh, unemployment has been high for a long time and shows very little sign of coming down. And uh, I just, you know, many people would think that the Federal Reserve has kind of shot its wad and, uh, you know, interest rates are zero. And, uh, uh, not too many people think we should have a bigger deficit. So I was just kind of wondering, is there anything we can do to bring down unemployment, or do we just have to wait this one out? I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great question. It's become very topical. I, I mean, I think the difficult answer is that we've done pretty much all we can do right now in the short run. So, you know, the interest rates are at zero. We've, we've done as much as we can do on conventional monetary policy. We're now doing unconventional monetary policy with rounds of... Uh, you know, quantitative easing, uh, named after a large British ship, of course, the Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> and uh, there's more recently, they did something kind of pretty unusual, which is the Fed guaranteed interest rates at the end of 2012. They rarely tie their hands in advance. They committed to keep rates low. And then the other main tool for government is fiscal policy, but we're pretty much out of ammunition. You've seen what's happening in Europe in terms of uh, big debt, and the last thing we want is to go even further. My sense is it's, you know, it's just too late to deal with unemployment. Now, the, the underlying problem is just a skills mismatch. So if you look at the data, what you see is the people that are unemployed across the country are basically low-skilled. They're people that have left. They haven't even completed high school, typically. So, uh, and these are people that have many, many lost their jobs in construction, and it's hard to find new jobs now. So the long-run solution, I think, is, is better education and better training. To try and fix this in the short run is incredibly difficult. And part of the issue is American companies are so good at keep taking best practices abroad 
So in terms of who you're competing with, you're not necessarily competing with the low-skilled guy down the road. You're competing with you know, the very driven person out in China or Vietnam where well-run American firms can export practices. So I think it's literally a very hard thing to deal with now, but I think the message is clear that medium-term and long-run solutions are around better education. I'll give you a quick example that was just amazing. Just a, in, a, in, a, in a microcosm sort of way, Intel has been doing very well as a corporation. They bought my company, McAfee, but they were, they've been growing massively. They were looking to build a new fabrication plant. It was called a fab. Some of you probably know, having been a part of this, this valley for some time. And they first wanted to put it nearby the Santa Clara facility uh, near in San Jose. The problem they had in order to build a facility, a complex facility, it was going to take them 18 months just before they could even break ground. And they were looking at that process 18 months before they can break ground until they can build the fab plant. It was another year, year and a half. This is an extraordinary long cycle. And this was going to potentially put jobs uh, in the thousands, if not even tens of thousands, potentially with a major fab plant of that size. So they ended up building it in Oregon. And the reason they built it in Oregon was they were able to build from, from start of permitting to construction in less than 18 months. Bureaucracy alone in California was the culprit there. So Oregon found a way around it. Now at the exact same time, countries like China were bidding on the same process and would have cut it in half again. So you're finding just basic bureaucracy problems causing some of the unemployment issues when in fact companies wanted to build it local and ended up cutting. Now fortunately it stayed in America in that case, but it could have easily moved offshore. So just little things like that and when added up across a lot of companies, just amazing to watch. And you know, here was just core city county bureaucracy costing jobs at that level. So interesting problem. Okay, so I just have one uh, more, and then we can uh, uh, eat maybe. But I have this. Uh, you have this impression that there might be two things that. We might have the wrong policies, but even more than that, I think a lot of people worry that there's so much uncertainty about what future policies are going to be that it is tough to make commitments, investments and commitments. For instance, you mentioned repatriation of profits. Well, companies sense that maybe they're going to win that fight soon, so they wouldn't repatriate now uh, if, they're, if, if that's going to happen. We don't know. We have a very little idea what the tax code is going to look like after 2012. Uh, the current law basically is set to expire at the end of 2012 by the last agreement. So that makes it a little hard to make decisions. We don't know whether the major health care reform is really going to happen or not. Uh, and you wonder whether all this um, uncertainty about what the policies are going to be for the life of an investment or why companies uh, are hesitant to invest. And I know that Nick Scott uh, thought about this a bit, but maybe all of you have had to, uh, is that part of the problem? And that's certainly what uh, we're hearing in the, uh, amongst the many things we're hearing in the political season uh, this, yeah. uh, at this time. I mean, I think, with due apologies to the policymakers and policy wonks out there, I think it's total bullshit. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, when I hear people, executives say, you know, my tax policy drives my behavior in running my company. You know, it's a fifth order bit. It is so insignificant in how we run a business. Certainly when you think of businesses like technology and stuff, where it's all about innovation and it's about building the best product, tax policy plays such a small role. Even some of the other things that people think are big issues, like I said, at the end of the day, the role of executives is to end up solving problems with pragmatic ways to do it. So it would be, it would be interesting, but not particularly uh, game-changing to have a more steady hand around policy. But I see very few of the policies as being things that prevent us from you know, building a strong business, growing that business, um, and being very profitable. You want to add on? <laughs> With that, uh... I, I completely agree with Carl. I mean, we find ways to get the job done. And yes, the regulatory pressures increase, the compliance, the transparency. If any of you have been through MDNAs and CDAs and proxies, <laughs> you kind of know what, what we're talking about. It, it's complex, it takes a lot of time. But in the end, 
you know, you get through it and you, and you operate it, whether it's here or anywhere, you get through it. So, you know, that's not the highest thing that I see either that's attracting from our, our challenges. We got other infrastructure issues that are much bigger than regulatory reforms or other types of tax structure changes that we would do as global companies. Just my yeah. So, why, I mean, this might be one of these classic cases of the two-speed economy in the sense that their area is both doing well, but also I think is, a, is a, uh, an industry that's used to taking big long-run bets, dealing with uncertainties. Certainly in terms of the evidence from, I guess, across the rest of the U.S. and a lot of the anecdotal evidence coming out, and when you talk to guys at the Fed, and in fact, my, my colleague I was working was up at the Congressional Budget Office on Friday talking uh, with Doug Elmendorf and Don Coe and a lot of the... Uh, guys setting kind of tax, fiscal and monetary policy up there, there is a major concern about policy uncertainty. Their concern is not so much, I guess, for high tech, but much more pedestrian industries around, for example, retail. So a big issue in retail has been health, has been healthcare cost uncertainty. And you hear endless stories of people not sure what's going to happen to healthcare reform, not sure what's going to happen to taxes. I was kind of amazed when I first came to the US about how you didn't know your tax rate uh, until the end of the year. I mean, a year ago, it was uh, left right into the end of the year to decide what was going on. The evidence when we've looked at it is economic policy uncertainty is at record highs right now. So the question is, how do you measure it? You can measure it in a number of ways. They all give you pretty similar results. One is you just look at the amount of tax and spending uh, that's about to expire. And it used to be 10 years ago, virtually nothing. So it's all very clear which taxes were going to be renewed. Now there's about 9% of tax revenue that's permanently being rolled over every year. You can also just look at discussions in the press. There's a huge surge of the discussions around policy uncertainty, partly US, but partly European. We saw it, you know, following what was going on in the last couple of weeks, there was a big quote in the BBC saying, never before the British public seen, let alone even could name the Greek prime minister. But now, you know, the guy is, uh, everyone knows who he is. And in fact, he's no longer the Greek prime minister. And in Italy, it's this revolving door of politics. Um, so I think, but I, you know, the, so, Empirically, if you look at it, it's all over the press. The third measure is if you look at forecasts of disagreement. So there's this Philadelphia Federal Reserve Board has a panel of about 50 forecasters going back to the 70s. They're not academics primarily. They're, you know, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, etc. And these guys disagree massively now about what's going to happen with tax and spending going forwards in a way they didn't. So if you look at this series, we've generated a series going back. It spikes every time there's an election, but recently it's just gone through the roof. So there's tremendous amount of policy uncertainty. In the long run, I don't think it's such a big deal. What this does is people delay. They delay investing and hiring, but in the short run, it's seen as a pretty major problem. And it's why there's policy focus on it. It's not obvious what to do about it. A lot of the issues in the US is uh, the parties have become so polarized and political power so marginal. It's generated a lot of volatility. I, I just don't think that's true. You know, I, I think it's a red herring that people like to throw out there. But let me give you an example. So, for example, we talked about the repatriation of offshore profits. What developed is the free market has come up with a great answer. Investment banks have figured out that this money that's sitting offshore in places like Switzerland and Singapore, they will loan against those dollars. Money sitting offshore is just fine. And dollar for dollar, I can borrow against, we have 85% of our cash outside the United States. I can borrow dollar for dollar. And so I think for most of the policy stuff, I, it ends up being an important yeah, consideration. But first and foremost, it's about how do you, what is your business about? Where do you invest? How do you grow that business? How do you keep it as well run as possible? And I think most of the policy issues really are, you know, second and third order effects. And I think it's convenient, and I think partially it comes about because of this polarization in the political sphere. And so people find it convenient to use that as a reason. But you know, even now when we say you know, the, the politicians are more divided than they've ever been, if you look back historically and you read, it's just not true. You, know, you can go back to the era of Lincoln, you can go back to you know, ha ha Hamilton and Madison and look, and say, you know, they were ready to duel with each other. They were shooting <laughs> each other. You know, the, the idea that Fox News and, you know, MSNBC is the worst we've ever seen, you know, just, just isn't borne out by the facts. <laughs> well, with that, <laughs> so I hope you'll uh, come up with some uh, better questions uh, uh, after dinner. But I want to thank Carl and Dave and Dick. Thanks a lot. Thank you.